purpose. And I think that's a nice transition to lead us into you know, management. So how do we manage um, off episodes? So, so Stu, why don't, um, why don't you give us your thoughts on approaching management? I mean, there's all sorts of options now. Well, for so long, we've focused on management on thinking about levodopa. How can we give it more, higher doses, closer together, fractionating the dosing? Um, but we're beginning, to, I think, to understand that there's maybe a different approach when we're trying to improve off time throughout the day and night or when we're trying to focus on off episodes. And I think we have adjunctive medicines that improve off time uh, throughout the day. They might be once a day medicines or more. And then we have on demand that, uh, therapies that patients can use as needed um, that may empower them to be able to end an off episode or turn back on more, more reliably. So I think we have to think about all these different ideas and then also think about the mechanisms of off and the value sometimes for patients in using a non-oral medication. And now we have a new era that's gonna be heralded with infusional therapies where we try to keep patients on all the time. It's so getting very complicated. complicated. One of the ways that I try to distill it so that it's not quite as complicated is to start with the amount of off. So if they are having off periods frequently throughout the day, if you can determine if it's before most doses that they're wearing off too soon, um, that might lead me down a different decision-making path than if it's just every once in a while. Um, because ideally speaking, if our goal is to not necessarily eliminate off, but to practically manage it as best as possible, it might not necessarily be an on-demand, it might just need to be a revamp of the scheduling of the medications that they're already on. Um, if they're having unpredictable or more infrequent off episodes that they can ideally determine when exactly how they occur or what they feel like, then the on-demand therapies might be even better. And that sometimes just helps stratify the decision-making process as opposed to being just overwhelmed with all the different options that are out there. But, but the easiest way a lot of people use it, more levodopa, like you mentioned earlier, because the patient is already on levodopa, uh, why not give them more levodopa? But to me, we also know the more levodopa we give, the more fluctuations we see, the more off we see. And is it really fair for a patient to have to take a medicine three times a day, and then our best advice is take it four times a day, and then five times a day, and then six times a day? Is this the best way to approach life, to constantly be thinking about taking the next dose so many times a day, when we have so many different options that might allow patients to stay on a three-time-a-day regimen and then try to bolster and raise the trough? And especially also, since we know that compliance as a human, part of the human condition, drops off after three times per day dosing, even if it makes great pharmacokinetic sense. Our field has been proud to suggest that taking it five hours apart and then four hours apart and then three hours apart and then two and a half hours apart, and now we can write minutes. out schedules. But maybe it's not fair for patients to have to be, uh, maybe they're not really sharing in that clinical decision making. If oh, we have alternatives. What if you use the long acting ones? I mean, you could use long acting levodopa and keep it at three or four times a day. Uh, so, so there are options, but, but I think long acting preparations still have their challenges. Uh, I, I think the gut is still there. You, they still have to make it to the small intestine uh, and, and it becomes a little bit more erratic in its uh, absorption from that part. But I think, yeah, you, you could use a longer acting levodopa. But we're also making the, uh, the leap from levodopa to either as needed levodopa or other adjunctive um, therapies, but we've missed some of the other drug classes that can be brought on board before you have to add on just more levodopa. So if they are on three times a day dosing and they're simply on levodopa, you can look to a dopamine agonist. You can look to an MAOB inhibitor. You can look to a COMPT inhibitor before you need to get to the um, on-demand therapy or increase the frequency of the levodopa they're already taking. So dopamine agonists, you know, are pretty good as adjunctive therapy. Uh, to me, uh, there are two challenges that I personally see with agonists in my practice. One is the older patients, they're much more likely to run into trouble uh, as far as hallucinations are concerned. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, especially the younger patients are the compulsive disorders. And you know, studies have shown up to 20% of the patients on dopamine agonists can have gambling, shopping, uh, sexual compulsions. 
Uh, and, and often the patients don't talk about them. So unless they come with a caregiver or someday you get a phone call from the caregiver saying, oh my God, he's out gambling every night, we don't even know those things. Uh, so, so that's the, the challenge I struggle with at times with dopamine agonists. But, but sometimes it may just be the pulsatility of some of the older dopamine agonists, especially some of the oral ones. I was trying to get a more level replacement of a dopamine agonist uh, transdermally, um, subcutaneously, may give better tolerability. And I think some of the newer studies suggest that dopamine agonists that are given on a more continuous delivery, hopefully we have some of these less compulsive yeah, But I, I think for the general physician, the fear that they feel liable and not knowing how often to monitor, not having tools to screen for the risk, obviously most patients don't develop these problems, but it's an uncertainty in your life. And, and the notion of these drugs being more efficacious than levodopa is not supported by studies. They don't prevent... But it depends which agonist you talk about. Yeah, and, and of course, it's, this is generalization, but there isn't evidence that they protect against motor fluctuations or dyskinesias, as was the past marketing-driven hope. It tells us that they are adjunctive therapies that are quite useful. They clearly have much longer duration of action, even in oral forms. And, but they join the COMT and, and MAOB inhibitors as other ways to stretch out the effects of levodopa. This is the bottom line that comes from studies. They aren't useful alternatives to uh, using any levodopa, but the patient with an agonist on board often is doing much better. And certainly problems like freezing of gait sometimes are helped as well as dystonic early morning symptoms. So they, they have a role to play and they should be on the algorithm of what we consider. What, what else should we be thinking about with the use of COMPT inhibitor and, and MEOB inhibitor. Do they before we go there, you know, the agonist is also some of these side effects are dose dependent too. So, so if we can, you know, initially we were pushing to the maximum dose with these agonists and maybe there is a sweet spot. I, I agree with you, uh, you know, agonists can be very helpful in quite some patients. And we just have to be careful, uh, do we need to push the dose high enough? Uh, or, you know, are they long acting infusions? other way to go about with it, uh, but you know, they definitely have a role to it.